Good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see everyone. This is the largest in-person crowd we have had since we've been able to assemble in person again. Yes, I see you about to clap. That's good. Go ahead, clap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, glad we're we're coming back together. Yes, and this this pandemic is is getting under control. It may not be completely over and behind us. It's coming under control, right? Just as we have prayed for this for so long, haven't we? Um, and good morning to those of you who are still joining us from home also. We are glad that you are joining with us too. Uh, glad that you're still there as that, that home audience on Facebook Live and will be on YouTube and our website also later today. We are very happy that you're there too. Okay, our young Christians which we know are, I'll come over here, so you don't have too far to turn that camera. How about that? And if I, I'm not very much of a ball player, so some of you might have to chase this down. It's a good thing Spencer sits right here in the front. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're young Christians. You know, you like balls. Balls are a lot of fun to play with, aren't they? They really are. And I have this piece of yarn here, too. Now, can you tell me what's the difference in this piece of yarn and a ball? Other than it's yarn and a ball. I mean, Captain Obvious there, huh? What's the difference? You can throw a ball. You can throw the ball, right? We can have fun with that ball. What about kind of well, you can throw this. It's not as much fun. <laughs> the ball bounces. The ball will bounce, yeah. Probably not so much on the carpet here. Let's see. Yeah, it will. How about this piece of yarn, though? Look, it has a beginning and an end, doesn't it? It has this beginning and end to it. But this ball, there's no beginning and end, is it? It just goes on forever and ever. You, if you tried to find the beginning and end, you'd just be sitting here all day going round and round and round, wouldn't you? And this particular one, look, it has the world on it. Can you see that? It has the world on it. So you know what we can learn from this? Jesus' love is just like this ball. Did you know that? It goes on and on and on. It's not like the, the piece of string, the piece of yarn here with that beginning and end. Jesus' love for us never ends. It never ends. It just goes on and on, all around the whole world. See there, right there is the United States, and we've got Canada over it, and then we, South America down here, we turn it around, and we've got China, and we've got Europe, all those different countries there. God loves every one of them, and every person in every one of those places. Did you know that? And his love is just like this ball. It just keeps going and it keeps going. And you could try to sit here and figure out where it begins, where it ends, but you can't do it. Because there's no beginning, no end to God's love. He's always there, always loving us. No matter what. No matter what we've done, no matter who we are, He loves us. No beginning, no end. So you know, whenever you go to play ball, whenever you see a ball, remember that. Think about God whenever you're playing ball, that that ball is just like God's love. No beginning and no end. He loves us forever <laughs> and ever. Hey, can you remember that when you play ball? Yeah. All right, let's have our prayer. Remember the way that we have our prayers, we pray together, don't we? I'll say the words and, and you repeat it back after me, okay? Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. That you love us. That you love us. And your love never ends. And your love never ends. Help us to love you. Help us to love you. And to love each other. And to love each other. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let's begin, would you like to stand and let's sing together God of grace and God of glory. <laughs>
Yeah, you may be seated. This this being Memorial Day weekend, we certainly uh, want to remember um, those who have given everything, maybe at that ultimate sacrifice for us here in this country, that we might have the freedoms we have, that we might enjoy that privilege that we have of coming together to worship as so many places in this world don't have. And so as we go to, to God in prayer, let's keep those throughout the ages, throughout the beginning of the, the times of this country, those who have made that sacrifice, let's keep them in our minds. Let's keep their families in our minds. Let's keep in our minds those who, who face that each and every day, who are serving now and, and know that they may be called upon to make that same sacrifice and those who, who are coming along in the future that may again be called to make that sacrifice. Let's pray. Oh God, we do come to you again this morning just thanking you for this beautiful day in which you have given us to worship you. God, we, we often take for granted the beautiful days you give to us so often we can find things to complain about. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy, it's too, too cloudy. It's all of these things that we, we find to complain about, but we, we rarely acknowledge just the beauty in each and every day that you give to us. And there is beauty in each and every day. And no matter what the weather, it all works together in your plan for our earth, for the way that that the earth makes the way that the, the earth works and, and that it makes the perfect dwelling for us. And we thank you for that. We, we thank you that you have given us this wonderful, beautiful place for to live, to grow. God, we just praise you. And God, we do thank you this morning. We thank you for this country. We thank you for this place in which we can come together to worship you. We thank you for all of the freedoms that we do enjoy here in this country. We know that it is not that way in so many different places in this world. And God, we lift those places to you. May, may somehow, some way, things change and, and they be able to come together to worship you also because we long for the day when the whole world can can worship you when the whole world can admit that that you are Lord and God we thank you we thank you we praise you for those who who have made that ultimate sacrifice for those who have given their very lives for us that have given their lives that we might have those freedoms that we might enjoy the, the freedom to come together to worship this morning, that we might enjoy the freedoms to gather in other places as, as we so see fit. God, we, we even have the freedoms to come together to protest all of the, the governmental issues, all of the, the government. We have the right, the freedom to even protest those those very ones who work, who fight to protect us. And although we may not understand that, God, many have given their all in order to give us those freedoms. And God, we, we just lift up to you this morning those who have given their, their lives, those who are in harm's way, who put themselves out every day, who know that they could lose their lives each and every day in order to protect us. We thank you for those who will come after them, who will make that same choice to put themselves out there to protect us, to protect our freedoms. God, we just cannot thank you and praise you enough for what these men and women have given to us for the sacrifice that they have made to us. 
their sacrifice is second only to the one that you made to for us. And God, we, we just praise you. We thank you. And we just cannot honor them enough in the same way that we cannot honor and praise you enough for that ultimate sacrifice you made, for that first place ultimate victory that you have won for us, that victory of eternal life which begins now, now in this life, where we can have a abundant, full life, full of peace, of hope, of joy here in this life, even in the midst of, of all of the things that go on around us, all of the turmoil that goes on, all of the despair that we see, God, all of the violence, the hatred, all of the division within our society and even within our church. God, we just pray. We pray for an end to all of that. God, we pray for that day when we achieve the unity, the unity that you prayed for, for our churches, for our the church, the, the body of Christ. We pray for that day. And God, we do praise you for those who have gathered here this morning, for this largest crowd that we've had since the, the pandemic began. We, we praise you that it has gotten to, to the point where we can come together again to the point where we can be together, where we can, can celebrate the being together with each other. We just thank you for that. And God, we continue to pray. We continue to pray for this pandemic to not only be under control, but to be eliminated. God, we pray for those who are still suffering from, from the illness. We pray for those who are suffering long-term effects and, and those who have permanent damage from this. We just lift them to you for your healing to be upon them. God, we, we pray for them and their families. We pray for the families who have lost loved ones during this horrific time. And God, we lift to you those all who are on the prayer list for this congregation. You know the needs of each and every one, and we lift those to you. God, we know that you are the ultimate healer, and we put our trust and our faith in you for your will to be done. God, we pray for our congregation this morning. God, that we can be your light shining in the darkness, that we can be your hands and feet here in this community, that we can spread your love, that we can share your story so that others will come to know you. God, that we, we can bring your kingdom here, that we can be a part of your will being done here on earth as it is in heaven as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. <clears throat> Last week, we started with Pentecost. You know, um, there in the book of Acts, and I said, we're going to go through Pentecost, and <coughs> or we're going to go through some things in the book of Acts, the early church. You know, we call Pentecost the, the birthday of the church. And so we're going to look at how that early church sort of organized itself, how they learned to be together in community with one another, how they they dealt with one another and things that came up, you know, among them and opposition from outside of themselves. So we're going to start today, though. It's still Pentecost Day. You know, Pentecost is such a, a big event, you really can't cover it in just one Sunday, right? So Pentecost Part 2, basically, today. And this is Peter's sermon.
There's a little overlap from last week, but Peter's sermon is what we're going to look at today. How things really started there with the, the church. And, you know, the second um, Acts, the, the word, the book of Acts is really about the Acts of the Apostles and how the church spread. You know, how they carried out that great commission that we found in, in Matthew 28 where it says to go and make disciples. That's what the book of Acts is all about. How they did that. How they went and made disciples. And as we see here on Pentecost, they, were, they received the Holy Spirit. They had been hidden away in that upper room, locked away, scared. But now, when they receive that Holy Spirit, they are filled with confidence. They're able to communicate with all of the people who were there in Jerusalem in their own languages. And it was such a commotion. Pentecost was loud. Pentecost was chaotic. You know, people didn't sit quietly during Pentecost. It was loud, it was chaotic, and people were amazed. More and more people came just to see what all of the commotion was about. Some were amazed at what was going on. Some accused the disciples of being drunk. And then Peter, you know, Peter, the one who had denied Jesus three times, even though he said he would not, Peter now full of the Holy Spirit, gets up to speak. And this is what he says. This is the very first sermon of the church. In Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read, that says 41, but we're actually going to read through 46. Because we're actually going to read the response of the church also. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, 
and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make you enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, isn't that a wonderful story? 3,000 people saved in one day. And then God is adding to their number daily. More and more people are coming to Christ daily. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, you're sitting there looking at me stoically, huh? Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Amen. Okay, yeah. There <laughs> you go. That's it's a great thing. You know, Peter, Peter, once he was filled with the Holy Spirit, God used Peter to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ, even to the very people who had put Christ to death. Yet to the very people that had cowered and denied Jesus just a few weeks before, the Holy Spirit is now using to proclaim Jesus. You know, the, the Holy Spirit speaks through, G, through Peter and his first sermon to the church. He, he says, you know, Jesus was handed over. He was handed over and put to death. You know, and he was, but, but God raised him. And be assured that this is the Lord. This is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And, you know, as he preaches this sermon full of the Holy Spirit, we, we're told that people were cut to the heart. You know, they were, they were convicted of, of their wrongs. They were convicted of, of their sin. And, you know, we define sin as being, being a part, being you know, away from God and sins are those things that we do because we are apart from God. And they ask, what 
shall we do? And what shall we do? What can we do? What is our next step? What do we do with this? We, we know that, that we, we are separated from God. What can we do? And Peter says, repent. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you for the forgiveness of your sin. Repent. Be reconciled to God through your repentance, through your baptism. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. You know, when Jesus began his ministry, some of those earliest words he said was, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. John the Baptist preached repentance. Hmm, must be kind of important, huh? Must be something we, we maybe should, should listen to. And, you know, but repentance, exactly what is it? Well, you know, I, I love how Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase of scripture, uh, called the message, I, I love how he puts that, that scripture, the, the words of Jesus there, because he paraphrases Jesus' words as, God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. You know, change your life. Repent. You know, that word repent, it can take a sense of being sorry for something. You know, being sorry for the things that we have done, for maybe the mistakes that we have made. But the real sense of repent involves a change of will within us. It involves change in our life. Not just being sorry, but doing something about it. Changing. Allowing God to change us on our own. We can't just say, okay, you know, I'm going to go in this direction because we're going to stumble and fall all over ourselves. But through God's grace, through allowing God to take control, we can do that. We can do it by allowing him to take control. We can completely change the direction. We could have been heading this way and then we head that way, the way that God wants us to go. And repentance is a change in behavior that results in totally different kind of life. And a lot of us, a lot of people go through life with regrets and feeling sorry for things they've done. But what we're looking for, repentance. Repentance, Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians, is a godly sorrow. He says a godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Leaves no regret. Because it takes it away because Jesus has already paid. He's already paid for that sin. Puts us on the right path. The path where Jesus is leading. Wherever it may be for us to go, Jesus is leading in that path. You know, this passage here, in this past passage from Paul's writing to the Corinthians, it, it basically says that, you know, when you have that godly sorrow, it results in that change of will and takes you deeper into the salvation experience. Deeper, deeper. You know, repentance. Repentance, it's not just for those who are being converted at the moment. You know, sometimes we, we get that kind of confused in our heads and we, we think repentance is for that person who, who didn't know Jesus. And we, we, we think of repentance as that person who first time coming to Jesus and they repent of their separation from God and then, hey, they're saved, they're going to heaven, life's good. But guess what? 
all sorts of stuff comes into our lives each and every day that calls us from separation from God. Repentance is not only for that first time believer, but it's for us. It's for us. You know, it's a practice that we have to practice on a regular basis. You know, we do that. We have to repent, not because we want to beat ourselves up because we're a bad person, but because we want to align ourselves with what God has for us to do. And we need repentance in our lives. You know, we're, you may ask, what, what is it that we need repentance for? You know, what is it? We're saved. What, what is it that we may need repentance for? You know, there's, there's all sorts of things. Just search yourself. See what it is. See what it is that may be separating you from God. You know, maybe some thoughts that you've been having. Maybe some, some actions that you've been having. You know, it, it, it could be, it could be those kind of not so good thoughts you've been having about someone. Even if they do really annoy you. I, I know that. <laughs> I know those feelings. <clears throat> those thoughts can separate you from God. You know, it, it could be, it, it could be that little gossip that you slipped up and, and spread. You know, you just, you didn't mean to, but oops, there it was. That can separate us from God. You know, it doesn't have to be those big things. There's all sorts of things. Blaming others for the things that that we maybe did ourselves. You know, we look at our, our churches today, we, we look at the body of Christ, we look within the, the United Methodist Church, we look at the decline of the church, and it concerns each and every one of us, the decline. And we, we look at Peter and his sermon here. How have we been at sharing the story of Jesus. Could our decline in churches be because we turned our focus inward on ourselves and taking care of us and we haven't been sharing the story of Jesus Christ? You know, we, we haven't been looking at those who don't know Jesus. Could it be we have empty pews not just because of the pandemic. Yes, that is, that's a part of it. You know, it has been the last year. But those empty pews before the pandemic, could it be because we weren't sharing the love of Jesus Christ? We weren't telling the story to those who didn't know it. You know, the, the story of Jesus, that first church, didn't really begin as church, did it? It was a movement. It was a movement. You know, that they didn't have a, a sanctuary to fill. They weren't worried about a building. They were worried about people knowing Jesus Christ. They were worried about going to make disciples. And that's what they did. They went to make disciples. They met together. You know, see, they said that they devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. They devoted themselves to fellowship with one another, to eating together every day, to praying together every day. You know, they didn't come together once a week and then go home to do their own thing. They came together continually. They prayed together. And the Lord added to their numbers daily. 
Where could it be? Could it be that as a church, not just Catawba, but as the United Methodist Church, as the whole church, that church with the capital C, the body of Christ, we need to be in repentance because we haven't carried out the mission of the church of making disciples. And we haven't been serious for several decades about making disciples. We got comfortable. We got comfortable the way we were. Could that be the reason for our decline? Where yeah, could it be? Could that be? Now, disciples are being made in other parts of the world. The church is growing in places where it has to be underground. The church is growing. They aren't comfortable. They have to hide with what they're doing. Could it be we've gotten too comfortable and we need to repent? And we, we have that same Holy Spirit available to us. I don't know where I'm at in my notes here. <laughs> I have no clue. But, you know, we have that same Holy Spirit available to us that Peter had, that the rest of the disciples had, when they went out of that upper room into the crowd to share the message of Jesus Christ, to share his love. What are we doing with it? You know, are we filled with that Holy Spirit to that where we just cannot, cannot stand it to not go out and share the love of Jesus Christ? You know, they didn't do it through just the word, through their spoken words. They did it by caring for people. You know, they, they did it, every single one of them. And not just the apostles, but every single person who came to Christ went out. They cared for the sick. They cared for the homeless. They sold their own belongings so they would have the money to care for those who didn't have what they needed. You know, they, they went out. They went out. And you know, back in the 1700s, along came a man named John Wesley. The church was kind of stagnated at that point. And here comes this man named John Wesley. And, you know, he, he wasn't really feeling it with the church at the time. But, you know, he was, he was a priest. And but he couldn't quite get into the way things were going in the church. He, he started different, different things. There's little, little house groups that he started. And yeah, the Holy Spirit began showing up in those, those places. He began ministering in places that the church didn't think was appropriate. You know, he, he began preaching in the field, something he did not want to do. He had a, a friend, George Whitfield, who invited him to come out and, and preach in the fields. And John Wesley wrote in his journal, you know, I would have thought it almost a sin for someone to be saved outside of the church. But he went out and he preached in the fields. And, you know, I think it's interesting that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. John Wesley averaged about 3,000 people coming out to the fields to hear him preach. You know, he never really did get comfortable out in the, the fields preaching. 
that he wrote in his journal uh, another time. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Anything he wrote in his journal another time. That, you know, that the field, the field preaching was something he just did not like. He'd much rather have a nice building, a cushion to sit on, and a pulpit. But he went to the field to preach because that's where the people were and that's where the people were coming to Christ. You know, then again, went on a little farther, the Great Awakening. Again, it didn't happen within the buildings. It happened out in the fields. You know, have, do we need to repent of our comfort? Do we need to repent? What is it? What is it that's separating us from God? What is it that in our personal lives separates us from God? What is it? What is it as a congregation that separates us from God? You know, I'd go farther. What is it as a denomination? What is it as the body of Christ that we have allowed to separate us from God that we need to repent? The Holy Spirit is here. The same Holy Spirit that was there to fill Peter and the rest of the disciples, that same Holy Spirit is here wants to fill us if we will only allow it. Let us pray. Oh God, oh God, we come to you this morning praying for your Holy Spirit to fill us. God, we, we know that so often we get off track. So often we let things come between us and you. We let things separate us from you. And God, we pray. We pray to be reconciled to you. God, we pray for your mercy, for your grace, for your grace to bring us to repentance. We pray for your strength to turn us in a different direction when we go astray, to lead us in the ways that you would have for us to go, those paths that you would have us to take. God, we, we do ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your forgiveness when we have allowed those things to come into our lives and separate us. We ask for your forgiveness for when we get comfortable and we don't want any kind of change. We don't want anything to happen that will, that will send us in a different way. <coughs> and we know that your love, your grace, your mercy is always, always available to us. You're always there for us, forgiving us, loving us. Give us strength, give us courage as we face the days ahead. God, open our hearts that we may receive your Holy Spirit just as they did on Pentecost, that we may go and tell the story, that we may go and show your love, that others may come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. May we join together in that ancient affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. But the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. change at the last minute. Uh, when we were originally, I was scheduled to come back for another year. However, that has last minute changed. And I will be now going to Oak Grove United Methodist Church in North Charlotte. Um, I will be, because I have vacation time left and because it is such short notice, and where I am going does pay a housing allowance instead of having a parsonage. So I have about a month to pack and find somewhere to live. Uh, I will be taking my two weeks of vacation there at the end of June. Therefore, my last Sunday with you will be June 13th, which is two weeks from today. And as I know, this is short notice, but we all know how these things can happen within the United Methodist Church. It just, sometimes that's the way it is. And so Philip uh, is coming now, and he has some information for you about the new pastor that you will be receiving. First off, thank you for your service, uh, being with us. And, you want to come up here so they can hear in the microphone? That's yeah, probably better. Yes, it will. 
Uh, let me repeat that. Uh, thank you for your service. That uh, you were a last minute to come to us with, with all that went on last year and the, the past 15 months. Uh, the Caldwells and I were talking this morning and made the comment that they feel like they've been on a different earth, a planet, and I I wholeheartedly agree with that. Our world's been turned upside down, and, and this is just another step in it, unfortunately. Um, thank you for your service and and your time here. Wish you the best in your new appointment and, and hope it's a good fit for you. Um, with that said, we will be receiving, and I got this letter as of 11.33 a.m. yesterday morning, so uh, it's, it's pretty fresh off the press. Uh, our new pastor will come July 1 will be Reverend P.K. Kim, a graduate of Korea Nazarene University. Bachelor of Theology, Methodist Theology University, Master of Divinity, Asbury Theology Seminary, Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies, and Boston University School of Te Theology, Master of Sacred Theology in Biblical and Historical Studies. A.T. has served as a youth pastor and associate pastor in Church of the Nazarene, most recently in Clarksville, Tennessee. P.T. and his wife have three children, six-year-old daughter who just recently graduated from kindergarten, five-year-old son, and a two-year-old son. P.T.'s wife graduated from Shenandoah University and graduate school. She majored in musical conducting after majoring in flute in college in Korea. She also plays the piano. P.T. says she is currently helping me as a housewife. <laughs> um, I spoke with T.T. momentarily yesterday. Uh, he was very excited about coming here, and he just kept telling me he was praying for, for the church, us, uh, and their family, and their move, and is so excited about coming here. Uh, so I hope that excitement spreads on y'all. I hope that the excitement spreads on, on Glenda as she makes a move that, that everybody is better suited and better fitted for each other and we can grow in God's kingdom and, and uh, bring people to a relationship with Jesus Christ because this day and time is more important than ever because of our time's running out. Uh, like I say, uh, Pastor Haiti will be uh, taking over July 1. So you know what I know. Uh, when there's updates comes along, uh, we'll pass this along to you. And thank you for your attention. Because as you know, that first Sunday, uh, we do we do give uh, our pastors time to kind of take a breather between the move and their actual first Sunday. So that second Sunday in July will be his first Sunday here. July the 4th, uh, our administrative assistant, uh, Tommy Lewis, will be uh, leading you in worship. And there will be some other, some... Uh, lay speakers who will be here with you the last two Sundays in June. And my last time with you on June the 13th, we will celebrate communion together. So now, as you go, may you go remembering that God is with us. God is present always, and that his love is like the ball that I shared with the children. There is no end. He is always, always present, always loving. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.